Uh, if you want to realize that you don't pray enough, prepare a sermon. If you really want to know that you don't pray enough, prepare a sermon on prayer. Um, if you've read the front cover of the uh, notices, um, you've got my first couple of paragraphs, but I'm going to say them again now anyway. What is prayer? Well, the answer given in the Westminster Catechism, uh, which is a summary of Christian teaching in the form of questions and answers, is prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. And I don't think we can do much better than that, um, that answer for a definition of prayer. But even with my Presbyterian roots, that seems a little standardised, perhaps even cold. It is what the answer says, to be sure, but it is so, so much more. For me, most of all, it is the greatest part of a close, warm, open, confident and loving relationship with the maker of all that is, seen and unseen. So why is it so neglected? Sometimes hard to do, find the time, hard to stay focused. Well, do we need to reset our priorities? Uh, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to read the passage and then we'll have a bit of a look. Uh, Heavenly Father, it is so good that we can come into your presence, as Steve has said, anytime, anywhere. Um, Father, thank you for that privilege. Thank you for welcoming us, uh, I guess, as it were, into your study as our Father. Uh, Father, help us today, remind us how important it is to have and to work on that relationship with you. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, it's on page 1051, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Saviour, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time, for this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. This is the word of the Lord. I will set against the background of the dangerous false teaching that threatened Timothy's church at Ephesus. Paul, in this letter to Timothy, calls for a devotion to Scripture, to the message of the Gospel, to quality leaders, to the courage of Timothy's convictions. And it's important for us to notice how our passage fits into this. In chapter 1, Paul has offered a bit of his own testimony and he outlines the seriousness of the challenges that are facing Timothy in the church in Ephesus. And chapter 2 begins his instructions for how to handle the situation. First of all then, I urge, he begins, and what follows is of first importance. It is the top priority, number one. Uh, Jesus knew that prayer was of first importance. I'm at point one in our outline on the inside of the bulletin. You just need to read the Gospels to realise that he prayed often and especially before critical moments in his life and ministry. 
most notably in the garden before his arrest and the great prayers that we read in John 17. Uh, The early church considered prayer a priority. Nearly every important event in the apostolic church was preceded by prayer meetings. According to Acts 1 verse 14, after Jesus ascended, the disciples were said to be continually united in prayer along with the women. Did Jesus and his apostles know something that we need to know? Uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, is one of my heroes. He was one of the most popular and successful preachers of Victorian England. His metropolitan tabernacle drew thousands each Sunday. It had a capacity of about 3,000. Um, often hundreds would stand outside in the street hoping to hear just a little bit of the Baptist preacher's message. Uh, well, one day a group of young students, um, seminary students, came to visit the church that they had heard so much about. And when they entered the huge building, they were met by a grey-bearded old gentleman. They thought that he was the cleaner. He offered to lead them on a tour through the building and answer any questions that they might have had. Well, they walked through the sanctuary, stood in the pulpit, looked down from the balconies above, and when they had seen just about everything and asked every conceivable question that they could come up with, the old gentleman asked them a strange question which they'd snickered at. Would you like to see what heats this church? Now, they weren't really interested, you could imagine, on touring the coal cellar or or having a look at the furnace room. But to humour their host, they followed him. They went down a narrow stairway underneath the pulpit. As the gentleman opened the door, he said, behind this door is the secret of this great church. Everything that happens upstairs starts down here. This is where the fire in the pulpit begins. The old man, actually Spurgeon himself, opened the door to reveal dozens of people on their knees in prayer. The great preacher would always insist that the secret of any church, big or small, was the prayers of the people. And it was Spurgeon who said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Prayer, I hope you'll agree, because I don't care how much we do it, it's not enough. It's the most underrated and most underdone of the Christian virtues. I guess you can start to see why it was hard to think about and prepare this sermon. First of all, or first and foremost, Paul wants Timothy, and by extension that's us, to pray. How amazing is it that the God who is so holy that no human could gaze upon the fullness of his radiant holiness and live allows us, but more than that, he wants us to come before him and share our needs, our hopes, our fears, our very beings with him. When we pray, we place ourselves under God. We give him his rightful place. And just as importantly, we put ourselves in our rightful place, humbly at the foot of Jesus' cross, at the base of God's throne, indicating our weakness, our helplessness, and our dependence, our complete dependence on him. Uh, Two weeks ago when we looked at the start of 1 Peter 5, if you remember, Um, But in my sermon uh, down at Mullally, I concentrated more on the second part, on humility. If you remember verse 7, it goes so well with today's passage. Casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Casting all your cares on him. Um, Your cares or your anxieties or your anxious thoughts, it's the things that we worry about. And we might think that it's more humble to not care or worry about things at all, to have an attitude of complete unconcern about ourselves or our needs. But if our loving Heavenly Father is there, caring very deeply for us himself and inviting us to cast our cares on him, then if we don't, it is in reality an act of pride. 
If we are truly being humble, then we will trust God to be what he promises to be to us, the most perfect father. We will look upon every trial and every cause of anxious concern as a gift from him that allows us to turn to him and trust. And the word that uh, Peter uses in verse 7 of chapter 5 is an interesting one, for casting is an interesting one. It means to throw something on something else. Uh, It was used only in the Bible elsewhere when we're told that the disciples threw their cloaks onto the donkey for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem. And what a picture that is for us. God invites us to bring our concerns to him and throw them onto him, stack them up as if that's where they truly belong. And the way that he says this doesn't simply mean that we throw our cares on our Father in a general sort of once-for-all kind of way. No, it means that we bring each one to him each and every time and we cast them onto him. How do we do that? Uh, Well, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 that to be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We throw each anxious thought upon him through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We say, Father, I'm anxious about this, whatever it is. But here it is, I give it to you. I ask that you do what is needed. It's off me and on to you. And I thank you in advance for your love and care for me. He calls those who are burdened and wearisome to come to him and he will give us rest. And when we do that, we are being truly humble because prayer is the greatest sign of humility. Because in it, I've lost my place. Because in it we admit that we can't do something and we ask God who can to do it for us. Prayer is the greatest sign of humility because in it we admit that we can't do something and we ask God who can to do it for us. Uh, Some time ago I read a helpful formula to go with the four types of prayer that Paul urges here. I'm at point two on the outline now if you're following along. And those four Bs are binding, bending, being, and beaming. If we remember these four B words, we will always have our prayers aligned rightly. In binding, we fix ourselves to God's will. In making those requests or supplications, we need to align our will with that of God. We need to be praying in a way that Jesus would pray as he taught his disciples, not in a way that our worldly polluted minds would want to pray. So we bind ourselves to God. We are to become one with him. Uh, When Paul urges prayers, he is talking of prostrate, down on your face, worshipful prayers, listening as much as speaking to him. (laughs) Prayer is not about changing the heart of God so that he will change some particular circumstance to the way that we want it. But rather it is bending, bending ourselves towards God and acknowledging that our chief end is to glorify him in all the things, even when our prayers are not answered in the way that we would like. In prayers of intercession we are being being in the presence of God on behalf of someone else. Uh, To intercede in biblical times meant to plead with the king, usually on behalf of someone else, usually a friend. And one of the best examples, perhaps the best um, example of intercession in the Bible is Esther, going before the king, who just happened to be a husband, but fearing for her life if he doesn't want to see her and, and put forward his golden scepter. But she goes in order to plead the case for the saving of her people from the wicked hand of Haman. But when we go before our king, we need have no fear of him not holding out his golden scepter to accept us into his presence, to hear our pleadings. 
Paul tells the Thessalonians that God wants us to pray continually, constantly, and pray in all circumstances. And good on Colin for reminding us of that. He wants us to come humbly and reverently, but without fear. And we can do this because Jesus is interceding for us. Uh, More on that later in a few verses. And the word for thanksgiving here is uh, Eucharistia. Not sure exactly how you pronounce that, Dan. And that's thankfulness or the giving of thanks. And you might know the word as referring to the Lord's Supper. It's the mindset, the act of gratitude. So once again, prayer is to be active, part of a lifestyle, not a ritual that we take place in once a week. It should be a part of every believer's daily, even hourly, as Steve said, living. It should be an active, vibrant attitude of gratitude for God, for fellow men and women, for the creation all around us and all the things that fill our lives. Because let's face it, if we believe that everything happens under the control of God and he's working it for good as we read in Romans 8.28, then we must be thankful for all of it. We must be thankful even when we cannot understand what God is doing in our lives. And there are often times when we have no idea how circumstance could possibly be for our good. Um, This particular section has provided a great challenge for me as I see wheat and barley crops losing yield every day and fallow fields ready for planting just waiting for a good rain to wet the top. And the company that we do most of our work for has decided it's a good idea to sell their farms. How can any of this be good? So I'm reminded by my own words, those four Bs, that if I bind myself to God's will, bend myself towards his way, be in his presence, then I can't help but beam with radiant thanksgiving for God's goodness in all things. One of the great lessons that we can ever learn is that the privilege, the honour that we have to bring requests before God was not given in order that we can just focus on ourselves. We need to remember that the primary target of prayer is others. I'm at point three uh, on the outline now. I'm a hospital chaplain, visited an old lady uh, in hospital. Um, As he approached her bed, he noticed that with the index finger of one hand, she was touching one by one the fingers of the other with her eyes closed. (coughs) Excuse me. And when the chaplain spoke to her, she opened her eyes and she said, Ah, Reverend, I was just saying my prayers, the prayers my grandmother taught me many years ago. The chaplain looked a bit puzzled and so she went on to explain. I hold my hand like this with my thumb pointing towards me. Um, so that I remember that those who are closest to me, and I pray for them. Um, Next, I use my pointer finger, and I'm reminded that I pray for those who point people to the way, for teachers, for ministers, for parents. The next finger is the biggest, so I pray for those in high places, those in authority. Uh, After that comes the weakest finger. Look, it can't even lift it up by itself. I pray for those who are sick and and lonely and afraid. And last of all, this little one, I pray for myself. Paul goes on to urge prayer for all men or everyone, but especially for kings and all those in authority. Um, Edward Hale, who I'd never heard of, but that's okay, he was a US Senate chaplain in the early 1900s. He was asked one day, when you consider the condition of our country, is that what makes you pray for the senators? He responded, no, I look at the senators and I pray for our country. Politics aside, we have much to pray for in this country, don't we? And it's fairly relevant to us given the last few months of division and I don't expect that to improve before or after the 14th of October. That has nothing to do with your wedding, Ben. Um, But here's a challenge for you. The next time you feel like complaining about the way that government is running, whether it's local, state or federal, 
Why not spend that time in prayer instead? Because what do you think would be the most effective method of making a change in government policy? Sitting around in a group having a whinge about how bad a job they're doing or praying to the one who controls everything that the Holy Spirit might make such an impression on those people that the process of conviction not only changes the decisions that they make but leads to the salvation of their souls as well. I think a reason that Paul uh, says to pray for those in authority, and remember it's the Romans who were so brutally ruling at the time that Paul is referring to as those in authority. But he says it's, I've got the wrong translation in this bit here, it says to live peaceful lives. I can't remember what it said in the, uh, in the Bible, in the pews. But that's why we're to ask, ask um, for prayers for those in authority so that we can live peaceful, godly lives so that we can tell the truth about Jesus without fear. Why was it necessary for Paul to urge prayers for those in authority after already referring to everyone or to all people? I think it's because he knew that we probably wouldn't. I think that for Paul's readers and for many people today living under oppressive regimes, it must be extremely difficult to pray for those in authority. Perhaps for us, it's the lack of interest or complacency because we have it so good. When was the last time you prayed for those in authority? And notice I said pray for, not pray about. I mean earnest down on her knees prayer for them to see God as real and that he wants them to be saved and that will make a difference to how they govern. Have you prayed for Anthony Albanese? Have you prayed for Penny Wong? What about Bob Catter or Lydia Thorpe? Or have you prayed for our local highway patrolman? Again, I don't mean praying, yeah, get her, yeah, teach him a thing or two. No, I mean pray for their salvation. Pray for the job that they are doing in keeping us safe. Paul goes on to tell Timothy that this type of prayer is is not only acceptable in God's eyes, but it's considered good. And the meaning of the word good here is the same that is used to describe how God felt about his creation. It is good. God, looking at his untarnished creation, unspoiled by the sins in the garden and the way that he looks upon us, seeking the best for others, regardless of where they are, where they were from, or what they have done, looking only into the future for what they might become. That is good. And it should give us great joy to be able to take part in the work of God and be pleasing in his sight. Paul gives a good reason to pray for leaders and all people, and that is that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now this doesn't mean that everyone will go to heaven but that God, who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but is pleased when they turn from their evil ways, he desires that everyone would turn to him. So we should pray first for a person's salvation or their continuing sanctification, their godliness, before praying for other things for them. Uh, Let me quote from an article that I read called The Value of Intercessory Prayer or Asking. Uh, My wife Angie went to a rough high school in Perth. There were few Christians there apart from one teacher, Mr David Bunton, who taught manual arts. In the years after he left his position, dozens of his former students became believers. Many have entered the ministry and become pastors and missionaries. I tracked down Mr Bunton, who is now 70 years old, and retired. He was stunned and choked with emotion when I told him of the many conversions since he had taught at that high school. Well, I wondered how his influence had brought such a harvest, and he told me that many times he had prayed silently over his classes as he sat back at his desk and watched them work. Apart from this, he hadn't done anything to influence these students toward Jesus. The only common point of spiritual connection the students shared was that they were prayed over by their teacher. 
Absolutely, this is a God at work. But it's an example for us to follow in binding to God and praying in accordance with his will that all will be saved. I'm following on then in verse 5 and at point 4 in the outline. There is only one God, a loving and forgiving God, and there is only one mediator, one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, For those in society and, and even sadly amongst churches that say that we should ease up on our Muslim brothers, they have the same God. I beg to differ. They may be earnest in their beliefs, but there will be many earnest people who will find themselves in a very unpleasant eternity. If we allow a quality of beliefs or that all roads lead to God, they just get there a different way, then not only are we devaluing or or belittling our mighty and holy God, but we're allowing, even encouraging the lost to continue in rebellion against him. If we don't call people to account for for fear of offending them, then they have no reason to change. We condemn the lost to an eternity in hell, and I believe that if we're not careful, we put ourselves in jeopardy as well. No other name but Jesus will open the gates of heaven. There is one mediator. Jesus is our mediator, and this is why Paul stresses to point out Jesus' humanity. The man, Christ Jesus, he says. A mediator is someone who brings together two parties who are out of communication or out of relationship. They may be estranged, alienated, or even at war with one another. And clearly we were or are all of those things to God. The mediator needs to have links to both sides to identify with and maintain the interests of both sides in the mediation. As fully man, but at the same time fully God, Jesus is the perfect mediator in this dispute. But he didn't just facilitate discussions, did he? No, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. He paid the full, perfect and complete once for all price. Through his spirit, he continues to take an active part in reconciling us to his Father. The book of Hebrews tells us how the separate and flawed Old Testament mediatorial roles of prophet, priest and king are combined and fulfilled perfectly in the life of Jesus. We see that he is the messianic king exalted to his throne as well as the great high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. At the same time, he is the messenger or apostle who preached the message about himself. Acts 3 calls him a prophet for the same reason that Hebrews calls him an apostle, because he instructed people by declaring to them the word of God. We who believe are called to understand this and to show ourselves his people by obeying him as our king, trusting him as our priest, and learning from him as our prophet and teacher. Most places in scripture we read of Jesus sitting down at the right hand of God because his sacrificial work, unlike that of the Old Testament priests, is finished. Jesus has sat down, but he has not stopped working. He is now ruling. But in the account of the death of Stephen, we read in Acts 7, um, 55, that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Well, Jesus is here the advocate or defence lawyer in the heavenly court. He is continuing his role as mediator, putting himself forward in Stephen's defence. And he will continue to do that until all the elect are presented to God covered in his robe of righteousness. Paul goes on then to make what seems like an odd statement if made to a friend. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. But we need to remember that this letter is to be read to to the whole church, 
It's not just for Timothy. And no doubt, we well, we can assume we know that false teachers were questioning Paul's call as an apostle, his mission, and so his authority in teaching. Paul asserts his apostolic authority given him directly by Jesus and that he had been sent to bring the message of salvation not only to Jews but to Gentiles also. Paul finishes this section with a command to the men to ensure that their prayers are not hindered by any impurity. Lifting hands in prayer is a way of humbly seeking God's blessing, an acknowledgement that all things come from him, and so reaching up to receive. But men are also more prone to violence, and there were some strong opposing feelings in the church at Ephesus. Just as a handshake was and is today a symbol of trust and acceptance, the lifting of hands indicates peace and trust. If you are shaking hands, or especially if you're holding them up in the air, you can't be fighting. Paul goes further in saying to do so without anger or disputing. Now he's not prescribing a particular posture that is best for prayer, but rather a proper attitude towards each other and towards God. Well, we're at the end at point five. Um, Do you remember the four Bs? Bind, bend, be and beam. Now please don't hear me say that they are a method or, or some fancy way that you use to take in getting your prayers answered. No, they are different realities of the importance that prayer plays in a close personal relationship with God and his creation. It's our attitude, bound together, listening, active and thankful. I've mentioned a couple of times today the difficulty that I've had at different points in putting this sermon together. Well, here's where the rubber really hits the road, or maybe our knees hit the floor. I'm calling us to prayer this morning. And not just for this morning. What I'm calling us to do is to place the ministry of prayer in its rightful, high priority position in each of our lives and in the life of the church. Well, if you're thinking, great, I haven't got time in my life for an extra sneeze and now he wants me to do something else. Well, you're barking up the wrong tree, as they say. If that were the case, I'd have to agree with you. I don't have any more extra time than anyone else. In fact, sometimes I'm trying to find a way to make some more. But I'm not asking to find extra time because you can't. What I'm asking us to do is put aside some other things and make the main thing the main thing. First of all, first and foremost... Get back to that close, comfortable relationship with our Father. This is what Jesus expects from his followers, dedication to him. In the garden as Jesus faced his his biggest, his worst, his most terrible trial, he asked his sleepy disciples, couldn't you even pray with me one hour? Jesus expected at least that much. And I don't believe that that is too much for us. So remember the four Bs for checking your attitude to God and prayer and remember that we have a perfect mediator at God's right hand defending us and interceding for us. Let's pray. Now how right and how fitting, Father, it is to pray at any time but especially after we've heard your word on this. Heavenly Father, help us to be people of prayer, people of prayer personally, people of prayer with one another, people of prayer as your church. Convict us of a need for a close relationship with you that only comes by spending time talking and listening with you. Amen.